Hey, welcome to my very first class on debugging. This is going to be the first of many uh, different debugging uh, uh, videos. Uh, so let's dive right in. Uh, I loaded up Visual Studio 2019 Community Edition and I created a brand new console application and uh, it is about as bare bones as you can get. It's just got a simple hello world that gets output to the console and if we run it, then we should see hello world. Uh, this is a deceptively simple program because uh, rather than actually testing uh, whether uh, we can output something to the screen, this only uh, is a validation of our environment to make sure that we have everything up and running and working properly. It is arguably the simplest program in the world, so uh, let's take a look at our debugging uh, stuff up here. Uh, first, we have our debug uh, solution configuration. Uh, we can switch between debug and release. And uh, with some projects, you may have other debug configurations listed or created through this uh, debug configuration manager. Uh, the key difference is uh, debug has a whole bunch of debug symbols attached to your uh, generated executable, uh, which makes it easier for you to uh, debug your project. It also does less code optimization uh, during compile time to aid you in your uh, debugging. Uh, in the release mode, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, compiler optimizations that get done. Uh, you uh, don't necessarily have your debug symbols included with your project. And this is intended for uh, a, an executable that you build for customers, which you're going to uh, give away. And this is going to be a uh, executable that uh, is optimized to run as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible versus one that you're using to actively develop against. Uh, so for the sake of our debugging, we're just gonna stick with the debug mode. And then there's also two different uh, processor architecture types that you can target. Uh, the first is uh, the x86 uh, processor type, which uh, is usually going to be a 32-bit uh, processor, uh, or it's usually compatible with uh, uh, anything lower than a 32-bit uh, uh, processor as well, but most of the time x86 means 32 bits. The x64 is going to be for 60-bit uh, or 64-bit processors, and uh, this is going to be uh, more common towards the more modern era uh, processors. Um, I think most processors these days are going to be 64-bit, and most operating systems are going to be 64-bit, but just in case you need to do a, a legacy uh, application, you can target the x86. Uh, this also has uh, things to do with the uh, assembly uh, instructions, uh, particularly with uh, SIMD instruction sets and stuff like that, but we're just gonna ignore that. And we're just going to leave it at the uh, bare minimum of the x86. So to begin our application, we just click on this. Uh, alternatively, you can go up to the debug menu and you can either start debugging or start without debugging. Uh, and usually I just press F5, which just starts debugging and start without debugging is control F5. If you click this button right here, it will just start with debugging. So let's go ahead and do that. And we have our application that says, hello world. And then we have all this uh, uh, information about how to uh, get out of this uh, screen. So we'll go ahead and click on that. And now let's uh, make a slightly more complicated uh, application and get into debugging a little bit more. So uh, let's, let's create some sort of a for loop with uh, 100 iterations. Uh, int a is equal to zero, a is uh, less than 100, a plus plus. And then uh, if within the body of the for loop, we'll just uh, write uh, count. And then we'll put out the uh, value A. And then we'll do uh, end L for end line. And because I am lazy, I am going to do using namespace std. Then we don't have to uh, specify the namespaces for these. And then uh, maybe uh, we'll do if a mod 5 is equal to 0, 
let's print out uh, hello world and an end L as well. Okay, easy enough. And this is, let's do a, a quick introduction up here. We'll just create a line break. And then oh, we should also add an end line there. Perfect. And then let's just duplicate this line of code here like so. And let's give this a quick run. And as you can see, our output has uh, count zero, hello world, uh, because zero mod five is equal to zero, and then count five, hello world, blah, blah, blah. So every, every multiple of five is gonna say hello world, and we're gonna go all the way up to uh, uh, 100. So that's our output. So uh, the next thing that we can look at within the debugger is breakpoints. So to set a breakpoint, you just go up here to the side of your uh, window and set these uh, uh, red dots. All I'm doing is left clicking in this area. And uh, let's, let's put one right here. So right when we enter into our for loop, we're going to stop the or uh, execution of our program or pause it and we're going to be looking at the state of our application and then uh, if we continue uh, we will continue until we hit the next breakpoint and then we'll look at the state of the application and then we'll continue onwards so uh, let's we'll click our uh, uh, start local windows debugger and now oops let's hide all this we don't care about that now we hit our first breakpoint. This orange line indicates the current line that our application is uh, going to be ready to execute. And up here we have a whole bunch of debug uh, controls. So we can click the continue button, which would continue running the application until we get to the very next uh, uh, breakpoint. Uh, we can also click on this stop button, which will stop debugging and completely shut down the application. Then we also have this restart, which will uh, restart uh, the whole entire application uh, from the very beginning. So uh, if you lost your place in your debugging session, then you can uh, start from the very beginning there. Uh, then we also have some uh, uh, controls for uh, the I guess the program counter or your current position inside of your uh, debugging session. So you can think of this orange arrow, arrow as your program counter, which is going to indicate the next uh, position that it's going to execute. These are how you can manipulate uh, both your program counter position as well as your current position within your call stack. Now, if you don't know what those are, we'll go into those uh, here in a moment, but I'm gonna be clicking on these things uh, uh, to move through this application. So the first one is we have show next statement, which uh, if if you have a cursor and a whole bunch of code, you can click on this, this, and it will show you uh, the next line of code that you're going to execute. So if you get lost in like 100 pages of code, this will return you to your current program counter position. Uh, the next line is going to be a step into function. Uh, so if you have uh, multiple functions, this will let you step into uh, the next statement within uh, a nested function. Uh, if you don't care about uh, stepping through a nested function because you've thoroughly debugged it or you just don't care about how it's implemented, you can also step over that function with the step over uh, button. If you are inside of a nested function and uh, you want to step out of it uh, and return to the the outer function, you can click on this step out button. All right. So within uh, the bottom section of our screen, and you can adjust these uh, windows as necessary, uh, we have a couple different things to look at as well. So we have a variable watch window over here, 
and this shows you uh, all of your current variables in their current state given the current uh, location of the program counter and uh, the state of your application. Uh, by default, I believe autos is turned on uh, and visible. So we're looking at A, which is our uh, integer variable here, and it is currently uninitialized to, to some garbage value. So that's the current value right here. Alternatively, you can also click on this locals tab, and this will show you the local variables within the current scope of your stack. Uh, since we're within the main function, the only variable we have is int a. So that's the only local variable. We also have a watch list, uh, which allows us to enter in any type of variable we want. And if that variable happens to be in scope, then we will see uh, the value of that variable here. So let's just put in a. A exists and is in scope, so we see the value, which is still garbage. We'll put in B as well. B is not a variable that is uh, currently in scope, mostly because it does not exist. So it says variable B is undefined. Uh, if you do not have these windows, you can uh, very easily go up to debug, and then I believe it's windows, and then you can find these windows right here. You've got your watch, so you can have more than one watch window if you'd like. Uh, you can toggle the autos on and off, the locals on and off, and we don't have the immediate, so let's click on that really quick. The immediate window is up here, and I will just drag that down as a tab over here, and I don't see anything here, so we'll just leave that alone. The next uh, section that we're going to be looking at is uh, going to be kind of like a, a higher level uh, view of our uh, program state. So we have our output window here, which uh, showed the output that was happening uh, during our compile time. Uh, because there was not much happening, we're just loading in a whole bunch of DLLs and uh, symbols, and that's pretty much it. Uh, we have a command window which we won't get into here. Uh, we have exception settings. Uh, we're not gonna get into that. And then we have a list of our breakpoints. So we only set two breakpoints here. You can see them here, but if you have uh, many, many pages of uh, code and you want to figure out where each breakpoint is based off of uh, uh, your breakpoint list, uh, you don't have to go searching through those hundreds of pages of code. So you can find them right here. And I believe if you double click on each one, it will show you exactly where your uh, breakpoint is set. And then last but not least, and very importantly, uh, we also have the current call stack. The call stack is a series of stack frames that get pushed into memory uh, within your uh, application's uh, memory space. And as you invoke functions, uh, those functions uh, create stack frames which get pushed onto your call stack. So uh, you can currently see we are only inside of our main function. There's a whole bunch of external code uh, between our main function and the operating system kernel, and we don't really care about any of that stuff. So main is going to be the uh, root uh, stack frame in our call stack. And if you had other functions, you would see them uh, add, added on top of the main function. All right, let's step through this really quick and see how our uh, values change over time. So we're going to look at our autos. We have A. We're about to initiate A to 0. So I step over this function. A got initiated to 0. And as you can see right here, this value uh, switched from negative 8,000, whatever it is, to zero. And the, uh, the color of this value is also red. Anytime a value changes color from black to red, it means that that value uh, was changed uh, since the last time you stopped uh, looking at your debug outputs. Uh, so we only step through one line. During that one line, that value changed, and now it's zero. Now we're going to output uh, some value. And at the same time, you can also bring up your output window to see how the output changes as you're stepping through each 
uh, line in the application. So now we have an if statement, if a mod 5 is equal to 0, this should evaluate to true. So we hit this breakpoint and we print out hello world. Now if we look, we should see hello world. It's easy enough. And then we loop to the very top of our uh, for loop. And now we are about to increment a. The value a increased by 1. Because that value changed, this turned into a red one. And now we're going to output uh, our current count, which is 1. And then we step through. And because this breakpoint is inside of the scope of this if statement, and this if statement did not get executed, we do not actually hit this breakpoint. Uh, note as well that this uh, breakpoint uh, only gets triggered during the initiation of our uh, loop. Uh, each successive time we go through this loop, we will not uh, uh, hit that breakpoint. So to demonstrate, I will just hit this continue button. And now our next statement uh, that we break on is here on line number 15. And as you can see, a is equal to 5. And as you look through the output, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we're about to output hello world. So every time we hit this continue button, we are going to be uh, uh, breaking only on this line and not this one. Uh, consequently, if we wanted to break on each iteration of this loop, we set a breakpoint right here uh, at this curly bracket and our program will actually set the breakpoint here on line 11. And then the next time we hit the continue button, we are going to uh, break on this line. So we should output, let's see, A is 21. We should output 21 next time. Sure enough, 21 is right there. Okay. And we can continue running through this over and over. Now, another thing we can do is set up conditional breakpoints. So by default, every breakpoint that we set is going to uh, break any time the program counter uh, reaches this breakpoint. However, if you right click on this, you can go to conditions and then you can uh, put in some sort of an expression which allows this breakpoint to be uh, hit only when something happens. So let's put in uh, a mod 5 is equal to uh, 0. Okay, let's hopefully hopefully that will work. Then let's step over this line. And now if you look at your breakpoint, you've got a plus sign right there, which means that there's more to this breakpoint than appears to the eye. So now let's continue running this. And now we have met the condition for this breakpoint. A is equal to 25, which is a multiple of 5, and we actually hit this breakpoint. And now we should go through and hit this breakpoint as well, and so on. Uh, one thing to be careful about with conditional breakpoints is that when you have many of them, your application needs to uh, check uh, whether or not the condition of that breakpoint is true every single time. Uh, it goes and passes through that. That adds extra overhead cost to your application when you're doing debugging. So um, sometimes you'll see your application take something like 10 times as long to run as it would normally with just uh, standard breakpoints. So uh, one common practice is to actually not use conditional breakpoints and instead, you use your code to implement your conditions. So, uh, for example, I would do if a mod 5 is equal to 0. Uh, where's, there it's my 0, like so. Oops. And then you can do some nonsensical statement like int b is equal to 0. And then you set your breakpoint on this and then get rid of your conditional breakpoint. And now, if we run this again, um, 
you can step over to the next statement. Uh, a mod 5 was equal to 0, so we did hit this breakpoint, and we did hit uh, this line of code. This line of code is intended to be kind of like a, a dummy, no operation line of code. It just needs to be something that uh, you can insert a breakpoint on. If we left this blank, uh, this uh, section of code would be optimized away, and it would not be possible to uh, actually break on it because there's nothing that's happening. So that's why we do this. Anyway, we hit the condition for our conditional breakpoint, and then we can inspect the state of our application. Uh, as you can see now inside of our autos window, b is equal to some uninitialized value. We step over that, and b uh, is out of scope, so now that value is gone. If you look at the watch window, b is also now still unidentified. And if we hit resume twice so that we skip this one, now we go back here and we can see that uh, we are uh, back on our uh, B uh, no op line. Okay, so let's let's make this program a little bit more uh, complicated and look at how our call stack works. Uh, let's declare two functions. Uh, the age-old foo and bar are good enough. Foo. And then we will uh, give these functions a body, void foo. And then let's do something like, uh, uh, let's count from 0 to 10. Oops. And I'm just making up some nonsense here that makes no difference. All we're looking for is uh, how the call stack works and how we can use that in our debugger. Okay, and then we'll implement var. And then for this one, we're just going to do something silly. Uh, bar soap tastes delicious. Hit L, and then we should also do an end L here. And then here, we're going to get rid of all this. And then we'll call foo. And then uh, let's say if a mod 5 is equal to 0, we'll call bar like that. And we'll just call foo once right there. And then we'll set a breakpoint right here. And then we will see how this application uh, behaves. So we'll begin our debugger. Uh, we hit our breakpoint for foo. Now, if we hit this step over function, we would step over the implementation of foo. Uh, we don't want that because we want to uh, dive into the stack. As you can see here, the call stack is in the main. So we're going to click this uh, step into function right here. Alternatively, you can press F11. So we'll step into that. And then we'll look at the implementation here. Uh, a is equal to zero. We already know how for loops work, so we'll skip that. If a mod five equals equal to uh, zero, then it should step into bar. Um, we'll just set a breakpoint here, and then we will, let's see, if we let it run, I think that's going to be good. So as you can see here in the call stack, we have main, foo, and then bar. Uh, foo is being called within main, and then bar is being called within foo. So as soon as we exit the scope of our bar very, uh, function, uh, this should be popped off of the stack, and we should only see foo. So let's look at our output window. We outputted uh, this line right here, and we are about to execute this line here. So we will step over this 
And then now, if you look at the output window, we have bar soap, tastes delicious, because it does, I love ivory. And now, you can see that our program counter is here on the uh, closing curly bracket, and we are about to exit the scope of this function, so pay close attention to this call stack here. And then we click on the step over button, and we are back inside of the foo. Uh, bar is now outside of scope, and as you can see in the call stack, uh, bar is no longer here on top of foo. And if we continue, we will continue running through this foo function, like so. And now we hit our bar again, and as you can see, the call stack here is bar again. Okay, so let us uh, click this step out function. And as you can see, because we stepped out of it, we completely skipped the processing of this and we went right here. So what else can we do with our debugger? Um, let's see, if we go to locals, I wonder if I can change the value of A. And now let's mouse over the value A and we uh, overrode A and set it to the value of six. Uh, so next time we're going to run through this, A should be incremented to seven, but instead I don't care about the uh, execution of seven because I wanted to see uh, the condition when it would hit this. So I'm gonna overwrite this and set this to the value 10. Okay, and now I will go in here, a mod 15, or excuse me, five is going to pass, and we'll go into the bar function and go through and uh, talk about delicious soap bars. Notice that because I changed uh, the value of a, uh, that doesn't mean that we go through our loop and execute it a whole bunch of times. As you can see from the output here, uh, we outputted a very different type of, uh, of value sequence. All right. And now we finish the execution of our loop and we exit, uh, re return to the main. And as you can see from the call stack, foo is no longer uh, in our uh, call stack. So now we are no longer uh, viewing that. Um, the next thing we'll look at really quick is uh, walking up and down the stack. So uh, as you can see right here, this is our current uh, execution uh, in, in the call stack, but we can always double click on the previous line in the call stack and it will show you where we entered into the call stack. So we know that we came into bar on line 27 and this is going to show you what the next statement is going to be once you return from the call stack. Uh, we're just quickly coming out of these uh, two scopes and uh, we're going to be running right here uh, to return to the very top of the for loop. Uh, you can also click here to see uh, where we would uh, finish if we uh, stepped back into the main function. So if you ever get lost in the call stack or want to see uh, uh, different variable states as well, you can uh, look at call stacks to get an idea on uh, the current uh, uh, variable states uh, in different stack frames. So for example, here we have the value, uh, or actually let's back up. We are currently looking at the foo call stack frame and within that stack frame, A is in scope and it's initiated to zero. However, our current uh, application stack frame is on bar and A does not actually exist uh, within our current stack frame. Uh, so it, A exists in the program, so it's kind of grayed out, but if we finish this stack frame and return to foo, now A is no longer grayed out and we can see its value. So this is a great way for you to uh, look at different stack frames and 
uh, see the state of those uh, stack frames uh, as you're debugging your application. Okay. Let's see, is there anything else that's super important? Oh yeah, uh, one other thing we might be interested in is going to be looking at the next statements within our application. So um, let's step into our foo function here, step into our for loop. Uh, we'll execute this, go through blah, blah, blah. Now, one cool thing we have with the debugger is the ability to set the next statement of our uh, program counter without actually going through our application in sequential order. This is a, a superpower that we have. So as you can see, we went through our loop once and outputted zero and then uh, talked about the deliciousness of soap. And then the second time, we are about to execute this line of code uh, talking about count is equal to one. But let's say instead we want to skip that and instead go here. Now we can do run or set next statement right here. Uh, basically, I take this line right here and I right click on it, set next statement. And that means we skipped this statement and now we are about to execute this statement instead. What we did is we moved our program counter from line 23 to line 25 without executing uh, the code that was on line 23. If we look on our output, you can see that nothing uh, was outputted there because we skipped that line. Okay, now we will evaluate that. That turns false, so we don't go into bar. Now we return to the top of our loop, and now we run through, we execute this line, and then we should see count two. And as you can see, here it is, count two. So we skipped uh, uh, several blocks of code by having our next statement be uh, wherever we wanted it to. Uh, I believe, let's, let's try this, set next statement, the operation will set the next statement to a different function. Are you sure? Yes. Now, uh, this is this is probably uh, a bit hairy. I've never tried this before, but if you look at our call stack, now we have two mains within our call stack. So we are about to see some very unexpected behavior. So I'll step into that and our main is now going to run through the foo function again. And it's going to just uh, continue doing the uh, same behavior that we've expected. And then we're going to go from zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And we'll just step out of that. We'll remove this breakpoint, step out, and then we're about to go through and output this. And then the question is, uh, yes, that's kind of what I expected. Uh, we had two call stacks here with two mains in the call stack. And because we set our uh, next uh, statement to be inside of a different stack frame, uh, when we uh, pop the stack frame off of the call stack, uh, our stack pointer was no longer correctly uh, uh, functioning. So uh, this this is the uh, error that we get here. And this is some sort of a, a runtime exception error. So best practice is to use that set next statement only within the body of an existing stack frame, because when you pop that stack frame off, uh, you'll run into those exceptions. Okay. Um, I think that concludes the very first uh, tutorial on debugging. Uh, next video, we will go into the uh, details on the process of debugging and kind of the methodology on debugging more complicated programs in a, a generic sense. So stay tuned for that video and thank you for your patience and thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.